this talk is going to be um, on tracheostomies and for most people it, it will be a bit of an update people who've probably worked with tracheostomies in the past on previous rotations or on call or to some people it might be quite new um, it is a bit of a whistle stop tour so if anybody's got any questions or they want anything following up um, please get in touch with us um, after the session or email us So first of all, we'll just do a very, very brief basic anatomy of, of our head and neck, really, just to sort of orientate us to where the tracheostomy actually sits. So the diagram on the my left side of the screen um, just looks at the, uh, the pharynx and you can see how the pharynx is split up into four different, four different sections. And then we can see on the right side of the, the picture with the tracheostomy in situ, um, we've got the larynx, which is a complex structure of cartilage, muscle and ligaments that serves as an entrance to the trachea and performs various functions, including phonation and airway protection, which will be important when we talk about the trachea. Um, and the larynx is subdivided into three sections. Again, not going to go into too much detail, but the three, three regions are the supraglottis, the glottis and the subglottis. Um, and actually the subglottis will come into a bit more importance when we talk about the features of the tracheostomy a bit later. Um, thinking about why patients have trachees, again, it's not an absolutely exhaustive list, but thinking about the main reasons why our patients have tracheostomies. So acute respiratory failure with expected need for prolonged ventilation. So the patients possibly that have been on critical care for long periods with other problems other than respiratory needs, maybe they've been unwell cardiovascularly or from other other systems and they're just going to need ventilating because they've been so sick so often they'll be tracheostomied for that reason failed extubations or failed attempts to wean from mechanical ventilation um copious secretion loads so again when we talk about the um the what, what a tracheostomy actually is we can think about why it's beneficial for patients to have um trachees who've got copious secretion loads Acute neurological insult resulting in altered state of consciousness. And again, that sort of comes back to being able to copious secretion load possibly or um, upper airway and oral secretions and not being able to manage that and protecting your airway. Similarly, with spinal cord injuries, um, often needing long term mechanical ventilation um, as they're not able to, to um, they've not got the respiratory muscle activity to be able to um, ventilate themselves and they're therefore needing support long term for that and actually a tracheostomy is the best form of access for that. Um, neuro neuromuscular disease resulting in need for long term ventilation again similar to spinal cord injuries. Um, upper airway obstruction so obviously if you're not able to ventilate through your upper airway then tracheostomy is going to be needed and Similarly, but just for more acute management of um, procedures such as ENT and max vax things, if you've got sort of acute swelling or airway obstruction that you need a trachea for acutely. Again, just to go through briefly, thinking about some of the complications. So trachees obviously aren't completely risk-free and free, and there are complications that come along with trachees. Um, immediate complications, probably some of the ones that we often see are not hemorrhage as such, but we definitely see bleeding often with our tracheostomies. Um, and certainly that crosses over into the early complications. Um, don't be surprised if you've seen a patient with a tracheostomy that's had it inserted within the last 48 hours and on suction, you potentially might get a lot of blood stained or very bloody secretions or blood stained stuff up. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna happen. You're not doing anything wrong there. And then certainly into the later stages of a patient having a tracheostomy, we often see this granulation tissue, um, possibly, which patients that have had, had tracheostomies in for a long period potentially have um, granulation buildup, which sometimes makes it quite hard for when it comes to decannulation. Um, it's just something to be aware of. But again, have a little look at that list of things. Thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of tracheostomy you can see the list of advantages is a lot longer than disadvantages um some of the things probably that stick out for us really is allows gradual weaning of support so you know for our patients that are needing ongoing ventilatory support 
they can have it through an ET tube, but actually if they can have it through a trackie, they can be awake whilst they're weaning the support at the same time as doing um, mobilization or rehab. Whereas with an ET tube, we know that that's a lot, a lot more tricky and we can't do the same rehab and mobilization whilst maintaining the support that they've got from the ventilator. Um, and obviously, eventually we can work towards verbal communication. Again, we'll touch on that in a bit when we think about cuff deflation and passing it valve. But again, with an ET tube, obviously communication is difficult with a patient or non-existent. Um, so it, we can work towards that. Again, just have a little look at that list. Disadvantages are um, with a tracheostomy, if you're not getting the cuff down and introducing that airflow to the upper airway, you can end up with quite reduced um, upper airway sensation, which can lead to problems with eating and drinking, um, which is one of the disadvantages. Um, but I think we're certainly quite good now at getting that upper airway sensation and deep dropping cuffs early, um, certainly on ICU. Just going to swap with Lorna. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about um, tracheostomy orientation and some of the types of tracheostomies before we go on to a bit of a practical demo. Find the right bits. So this slide just shows a typical tracheostomy tube, which we see in uh, practice. So this is a Portex trache. Um, so just talking through the different parts of the tracking, then we can show you some of these when we go on to our practical bit. Um, at the top here, we've got the flange, which is the um, part of the tracky that's on the outside of the patient. So you'll see you've got the little holes for the um, tracky tie to uh, so hold that in place in the patient's neck. Um, we've got the tracky tube, and then we've got the um, cuff, which um, keeps the tracky in place. And that's the main purpose of that is to provide airway protection. So when that's up, it um, creates a closed system. It stops aspiration or prevents a significant aspiration because um, essentially sort of, um, closing the airway so the patient's just breathing through the tracheostomy. So the risk of uh, secretions um, going down the trachea are much less. Um, because the cuff is you know, perfectly circular pretty much and someone's trachea, trachea internally, the internal shape might not be quite the same, there, there can be some gaps so you can't completely prevent aspiration um, and likewise there might be some leaking uh, of air as, as the patient's ventilated but in the main that will um, sort of close that gap. Um, the balloon that we see at the bottom is attached to that and that's how we inflate the um, uh, the cuff. So we've got this air injection port at the end where we can inflate with a um, syringe to pop air into the, this um, balloon and then down into the cuff. And we'll get a bit of an idea of how inflated um, that um, cuff is from there. But we also check with the manometer, which we've got a picture of on the right hand side, which will give us an accurate pressure. And you can't always tell, you, you can obviously tell the difference between a completely deflated cuff and um, an inflated cuff with the balloon. Um, the other aspect we have is this aspiration port, the subglottic aspiration. So most of the trackies that we now see in practice on critical care do have these, but there are some that don't. And we'll talk about some of the types of trackies in a minute. Um, so usually you'll see this in place. Um, so you've got two things kind of dangling out of the tracheostomy and they, they do have slightly, you know, quite different ends. So you can put a syringe onto the aspiration port to clear any secretions um, that are sitting above the, the cuff with, with the aspiration port. Um, in terms of the different sizes of tracheostomies, um, they go from size nine, six to nine or 10. Um, I found one this morning that was 10, they're massive. Um, so most people have a size seven or eight, six is quite a small one. Um, and you'll see that size written on the cuff. So you can just about see it on um, this picture that we've got here, but it'll also be on the, on the flange. And it is, it is sort of, um, mm -hmm indented on the actual trachea, but 
that's no use when it's in a patient. Um, so that's important for us to note when we're thinking about suctioning the patient. So um, we use the usual calculation to calculate our suction and catheter size of times two minus two. So if we've got a size eight trachea, uh, we'd be using a size 12 catheter. So some better pictures here of some of the different types of tracheostomy. So the portex that just mentioned, a cuff tracheostomy, um, and has, has the subglottic port. Um, occasionally you may see some of these shyleys, but these are probably these have been around a bit longer and we don't use them so much. The main difference is that um, they, the inner tubes um, allow for a fenestrated um, area at the back. So there's a hole and we, ha um, we have an, a fenestrated and non-fenestrated inner tube um, to um, aid with weaning. And we might see some of these in some of the longer term tracky patients. We don't see them as often now. Um, there's no subglottic port on these either. And there's something we do see um, a bit more often is these adjustable flange tracheostomies. Um, so these are um, used for somebody who's got a greater amount of soft tissue around their neck where, where one of these smaller trachees isn't going to go very far. Um, so just increasing the size won't necessarily increase the length you know, um, enough and you could end up with a tracheostomy that's still too wide, but not long enough. So the adjustable flange comes in the same sizes, but the, the length can be adjusted. So we can move the, the flange closer or further away to, to allow sort of a better fit, if you like. Again, it's got no subglottic um, port there cuff is there as usual and all of these have inner tubes which we'll show you in a moment so when you go to see a patient with a tracheostomy hopefully you'll find that they have this tracky sheet above their bed it's got some information on it about um the procedure that they've undergone so um whether it's a surgical or a percutaneous tracheostomy so surgical um uh, tracheostomy is um, a surgical dissection down the trache trachea that's um, created a window in the trachea and then inserted the um, tracheostomy tube. Um, the percutaneous um, has, it refers to a number of different techniques, um, uh, which might be a gradual dilation, forceps dilation. Those ones are um, tended to be done on the unit and somebody, as it suggests, a surgical um, tracheostomy would be done in theatre. So you've got some information about what type of trachea the patient has. Um, the size as well, so again, um, that's useful for you to know. Um, and perhaps some information about if you're needing to put out an emergency call. And you'll also have this um, emergency algorithm uh, to hand. So if you're having any problems, um, you can follow this flow chart. We are going to go through that in a bit more detail later on. The other thing that should be present is the blue box. So um, a little blue plastic box containing um, various tracky pieces. Um, so inner tubes, um, a set of forceps is usually in there, um, a small a sort of paediatric oxygen mask if you were needing to um, uh, ventilate over the um, tracheostoma, um, uh, another trachea of the next size down usually, and some you know, perhaps the um, brushes for, for cleaning. Um, so you've got the emergency equipment that you would need to hand. So we're going to go on to talk about passive muir valves now and when we do some demonstrations in a moment we'll show you how to insert the tracheostomy in line with the ventilator tubing. So first of all just talking about what a passive muir valve is, it's a one-way valve which allows air to travel in through the valve and then closes off when the patient breathes out so um, the air isn't traveling out of the valve. You can just about see on this picture that it's got a sort of Opaque, opaque 
background um, just behind the sort of wheel looking part at the front of it. And that's like a thin film of plastic which will close when the patient breathes out. So it forces that exhaled air to travel up and out of the upper airway over the vocal cords. So it enables patients to um, start to speak, start to swallow. Um, it's an important aspect of our weaning process and perhaps for some people with longer term trachees, um, we see a big part of gaining some more independence and um, uh, ability to communicate and things like that. So just thinking about why we use the plastic mirror valve, as I've covered a little bit there, um, it's an important step in our weaning. It means that we're starting to get air flowing past the vocal cords and in, into the upper airway. So the patient um, is progressing with um, the ventilation. We start to reduce pressures on the ventilator. It enables them to have a voice. Um, it enables them to swallow by re restoring natural airway pressure. So uh, we can start to do some swallow assessments or speech and language therapy can start to do those. And we can start to work alongside speech and language, speech and language therapy colleagues um, to look at um, so increasing eating and, and drinking. Um, it can help with se secretion clearance in that if the patient's able to cough, they can then start to cough some secretions uh, above the um, tracheostomy level and uh, you know, expectorate secretions. Um, we want somebody to have a good strong cough when we're looking towards decannulation. So um, this is a good way to start to get your patients clearing more secretions more independently. Um, it improves their smell, smell and taste by sort of having that air passing um, past the the, uh, the larynx and the, the upper airway. Um, and obviously all of that can have huge psychological benefits for the patient. So thinking about when to do this, um, Ideally, we want to introduce a passive mirror valve as soon as possible. And the SOP um, states that it, it can, can be 48 hours post insertion. So obviously day one after a trachea, we're not gonna start it then, but, um, but yeah, after 48 hours, um, that's when we can start to consider it. We need to think about the amount of support that the patient's on. If they're, obviously if they're still requiring um, significant amounts of respiratory support and they're still sedated um, and uh, you know, unstable from a medical point of view, then it, it um, may not be appropriate at that point. Um, but provided they're, they're um, on a sort of adequate amount of support, then we can start to introduce it. Even if we don't think they're going to suddenly start having a conversation with us, um, that um, trial of cuff deflation, starts to initiate that sensation of air within the upper airway. Um, so we, you know, we might not be expecting to have a full on chat with them, but um, making a start um, on their weaning process is important. Um, but we also, and we also need to think about adequate secretion management. So if they've got a lot of oral secretions that are cooling and we're, we're, there's gonna be a high risk of um, aspiration, then it, it it may not be safe to do so. We may need to work alongside the MDT to consider how we can get to a point where it is going to be appropriate. Um, we would look at the subglottic aspirates, so checking on the charts, see how much has been cleared each time the nursing staff are doing that, noting how much you're clearing when you're doing your, your treatment. Um, and in terms of support, um, we're all there is a theory that we, by deflating the cuff, you're obviously losing a lot of pressure because the cuff is there to sort of give us a closed system. So the air that the ventilator is blowing in is going to start to leak out um, around the tracheostomy. Um, and we might be worried about de-recruiting, particularly if somebody's on very high pressures. There is some evidence um, now suggesting that patients don't particularly de-recruit when the cuff is down. So we may consider um, cuff deflation with patients when they are on um, slightly higher pressures, but um, obviously that's something that we assess for each patient. So there's steps as to how we um, uh, deflate the cuff and um, insert the, in, the passive mirror valve. Um, first of all, we would aspirate the subglottic if that's available. 
and then we do a slow deflation of cuff of the cuff with a 10 mil syringe. We'll be checking while we're doing this for adequate airflow. If, you, if you're hearing air or voice, um, that's a good sign. Um, if you if they're on the ventilator, um, as we're going to demonstrate in a, in a moment, um, you could also be looking at the ventilator screen to see what percentage leakage you've got or um, wh whether you're sort of losing tidal volumes on a um, on somebody on an invasive mode. You would see on the ventilator it's um, showing you sort of losing tidal volumes if you're getting some airflow. Um, if you're not losing tidal volumes, that would suggest there's um, essentially not a lot of space around the tracheostomy. Um, if you're on an, if you switch to a non-invasive mode, then you'll see the percentage of leak leakage. Once we're happy with good airflow, we can insert the passive valve, which we'll demonstrate in a moment. The sort of safety warning to mention here is never to put the passive valve in with the cuffs up. Um, if we do this, air will travel in through the valve, but then it will close off when they breathe out. If the, if the, if the cuff's still up, the air is traveling upwards. Um, uh, it, it's unable to travel upwards, sorry. So the, the patient's gonna suffocate. So never ever do that. So I'm just gonna show you a picture of the passive valve SOP um, before we go on to the practical. Uh, so if you wanted to look at this a bit more closely, um, we've got the link there at the bottom. So we're just gonna do a little swap over and um, show you how to insert the passing your valve. Yeah, I'm doing it. Lovely. Hope everyone can see me and my friend here. Um, what were we called in? Tracky, Tra Tracky, Tracky Trev. Tracky Trev. Um, yeah, Lorna's just gone through the steps on the PowerPoint of how we think about inserting and, and we're kind of going to go through inserting and taking out the passive valve. So some of you will be familiar with patients who look a bit like this, well, not maybe like this, but with a tracheostomy and um, with closed circuit suction on ICU, with ventilator tubing and an entire CO2. Um, if we were going to do a a cuff deflation on a tracheostomy patient the first thing that we want to do is just make sure that the chest is nice and clear so we do a closed circuit suction if we can for this patient maybe do a bit of oral suction with a yanker um, and then like Lorna said if your patient's got a tracheostomy that has a subglottic put up which is this one so without the balloon on the end we'd get a 10 mil syringe and aspirate off the subglottic so draw back pull back and see if you're getting anything. You might need to do a couple of them. If your patient doesn't have a tracheostomy that's got a subglottic port, which there are some tracheostomies that have that, which I'll go through in a second. What you need to do then is get a little buddy probably and do a simultaneous suction as you're deflating the cuff so that you're at least trying to suction off anything that is potentially gonna be aspirated um, from above the cuff when you take, take the cuff down. Once you're happy that you've done some suction, you've done the subglottic aspirate if you, if you can, you want to take the cuff, get a clean 10 mil syringe, and then if you've already done your subglottic, you can start to deflate the cuff really slowly. So remember that this patient has currently got no airflow in their upper airway, and actually you're about to reintroduce that airflow. So rather than just doing it really quickly and sort of making that air rush, just be quite considerate and just do it nice and slowly, certainly if it's the first few times that the patient's had it done. So nice and slowly and just seeing how they're managing. You might start to hear a bit of gurgling um, in their upper airway. Potentially they might cough something into the mouth as that airflow gets reintroduced. So slowly taking the cuff down, pulling back on that 10 mil syringe and taking all of the air out until all the cuff's completely flat. Again, if you were doing a, a um, 
simultaneous suction you'll have done that at the same time simultaneously as you're sort of slowly taking the cuff down as the patient maybe starts to have a bit of a cough cuffs down now and we're just going to observe our patient if they're on monitoring we just want to keep an eye on our sort of heart rate respiratory rate um sats and just make sure that they're managing okay if your patient isn't on monitoring which they probably will be but at bare minimum just at least keep the, the sats monitor on them so you can see what's going on see how see how he's doing at this point we might be able to start hearing some voice or a bit of a whisper and again hopefully he'll potentially coughing something up into his mouth get the anchor suction like Lorna mentioned if this is a patient that's on a ventilator so they've got um, they're attached to a ventilator what's probably going to happen at this stage if they're on a mode that the ventilator thinks is an invasive mode is that now there's going to be a big leak in the system because our cuff's down and we've got a lot of air escaping out of our nose and mouth so the ventilator should start to alarm which normally is something bad but in this case it's a positive sign because we want to know that the ventilator thinks there's a big leak now and that's what we're trying to achieve um, so those of you that have worked on ICU will be familiar with that and at that point we often switch them to the non-invasive mode um, so that it's a bit the ventilator is a bit happier what we are going to do just to touch on that is because we couldn't get a ventilator here for the training is um, we're going to do some separate videos and pop, pop them on YouTube next week which will show you how to swap the modes over and just to make you a bit more familiar with what you might see when you drop the cuff so have a look at that um, once we're happy that our patient's managing we can then pop the passive mule valve in. So what we don't want to be doing is putting the passive mule valve in. If, our, if we're not convinced that our patient has got good airflow around the tracheostomy and good upper airway patency or uh, upper airway patency, because like Lorna went through with the slides, um, if your patient doesn't have upper airway patency and you're putting the valve on, you could potentially cause a lot of damage and end up suffocating. So passive mule valve comes in a little turquoise box like this. And then this is the valve. What we need to do for this patient, because he's on a ventilator and he's got the ventilator tubing, is we just need to put it in line in the circuit, which requires a second little connector, which looks like this. Pop them together like that. So air goes in through the front of the valve here, and this is the patient end. So we're going to pop that on like that. And then we want it to be as close to the patient as possible. So we're going to pop it here, which is just beyond the um, lateral connection of the closed circuit suction we're going to pop it in there so what we would have done if we're on a, if the patient was being ventilated is just stand by the ventilator so that we're not getting all the the flow from the ventilator disconnect pop the valve in and then restart it um with just being particularly covid friendly at the moment with all the aerosol generating stuff pop it in and then hopefully if the patient had a voice before they'll potentially now have an even stronger voice um, or we would hope so because we're just restoring that sort of more more normal airway pressure really and rather than them now breathing out through the nose and mouth with the cuff down and through the tracheostomy everything's going to be coming up over the vocal cords and out of the nose and the mouth so in reverse if we're going to take the valve out so in keeping with our sort of very strict safety rule of never have the cuff up um, with the valve in we want to do it in, in exact reverse order so first of all we're going to take the valve out so stand by your ventilator remove connecting back up valves out and then we're going to put our cuff back up so pop in exactly the air that you took out of the cuff back in nice and steady and then checking it with the manometer so Lorna had a picture of the manometer on the screen earlier didn't she so um, the pressure gauge and you'll see on that there's a bit of a green shaded area between the valve between the pressure that you want to get it to so normally somewhere between 25 and 30 35 centimeters of water so pop that on the end and just check that you've got the pressure um, correct on that the patient for people sorry that aren't familiar with the um the ventilator tubing you might often see patients who who've just got tracky mask over there tracky in that instance you don't need to bother with the extra connector you can take the cuff down take your do, do use the blotic take your cuff down and then pop your valve straight onto the end of the tracky with your tracky mask over the top that's potentially what you might see a bit more um certainly on on the wards if wards take trackies <laughs> 
So just to have a little look at some of the other trackies quickly that um, Lorna talked about in her slide. So the one we've got, um, the one that you'll see most of the time in probably majority of the patients is the um, Portex. So it's called the Portex trackie. And as we can see, we've got our um, subglottic port and our cuff. And the inner tube for this one is a little ring. I don't know whether you can see that, a little ring sort of thing. And in order to take the inner tube out of that one, you pull the ring and it just slides out. Okay. Um, the other one that we talked about was the, the Shiley, which is this white one like this. So like we had said, this one unfortunately doesn't have um, a subglossic port. So you'd have to do the simultaneous suction with that one. Um, but we've still got our cuff. And the inner tube on this one is a sort of um, twist and pull out and then it twists to lock. So as you can see, this is actually a fenestrated one. Can you see a little hole in the top? So at the moment we've got a non-fenestrated inner in, so we've got a completely solid inner in that one. Whereas if we were to swap it to the fenestrated inner, that's got exactly the same hole in the same place. I don't know if you can see that, um, which will line up with the the hole on, in the tube and again we don't often see this um, but sometimes doing our sort of longer term trackies to help with weaning. The main thing really about the fenestrated tubes is that if you've got a fenestrated inner inside your trackie you just need to swap it to the non-fenestrated in order to suction um, because the risk of the suction catheter traveling through the hole and damaging the trachea really. And the last trackie is our adjustable flange which is obviously our bigger trackie with the flange that adjusts up and down to change the length of the trackie for our um, slightly bigger patients. Um, and again, no subglottic port on that one. And similar to the Portex, it's got a little ring um, on the end in order to pull the inner tube out. And the nice thing about the subglottic tube, I, it, the adjustable flange tube, I think, is it's quite flexible um, and actually for moving patients and sort of mobilising them and rehabbing them, they're actually quite a nice trackies. I think they're, they're, they, they, they have a bit more give in them, I'd say, and they're just a bit nicer and they don't pop off quite as easy sometimes. So that's your adjustable flange, which you can tell when you, com com when you compare them, um, the length of them, quite a bit different. So they're just in order to get through um, soft, more soft tissue, really. Have I gone through everything there? Yeah. Yeah. Decalibration on the screen. Yeah, um, we're just going to share the PowerPoint again to think about sort of if we were to think about heading towards decannulation with our patients, um, we've got a bit of a checklist that we would like to go through to, for other considerations. Have a look. Hopefully that should just start to screen share again now. There we go. So thinking about how do we how do we work out if our patient's appropriate to take their trachea out, so to decannulate them. Um, again, not a completely exhaustive list, but it definitely makes us start to think about if our patient's appropriate. So First of all, an appropriate level of consciousness. When we think about consciousness, that obviously comes with, is our patient able to be awake enough and be conscious enough to manage their upper airway secre um, saliva and secretions? So obviously we normally all create saliva, don't we? Naturally, we swallow it. If you're not awake and conscious enough to be able to do that yourself and you're not protecting your airway, it's going to potentially go down into your um down your trachea and into your lungs. Minimal respiratory support. So again, often trackies are put in for um, re requirement for respiratory support. So hopefully, if you're thinking about decannulating them, they're actually not requiring that anymore, or they're at least requiring something that can be given without the tracheostomy in, whether that's 
some sort of facial CPAP or NIV potentially if, if really needed. Head control, um, you know, have they got good enough head control to maintain um, sort of good upper airway patency or are they going to be flopping all over the place and potentially occluding their airway? Effective secretion clearance. So often one of the reasons patients have trachies in is to ensure that we can clear the secretions effectively. Um, so if someone's still needing lots and lots of deep suction um, or potentially needing treatments with the clearway and things, is it going to be is it going to be a problem if that trachea comes out and or, or can you know can the treatments be done without the trachea in? So if someone's using a clearway, for instance, can it be done facially or is it just going to not you know oh is it not going to be effective enough and are we not going to be able to clear it? Can they cough stuff into the mouth? Um, you know, or, or are they still needing deep suction? Salivary management, which again that sort of comes under some of the other categories, but. Again, if patients aren't able to manage their own saliva, they're potentially going to be at risk of aspirating it. Um, so is that under control? And do we need to get, have an MDT discussion about, um, is there other things that we can do to help manage saliva in terms of medications, hyacin, glycopyrrolate, things like that? Are they tolerating cuff deflation? Um, so clearly one of the things that your patient needs to be able to do before they have the trachea out is almost have that as much normality restored as possible so having the cuff down and being able to tolerate the passive muir valve is probably as near to normal as you can get with a tracheostomy and apart from capping off and sort of um, occluding the trachea so you know can they can they tolerate cuff deflation and are they doing that for sort of you know 24 hour periods continuously Upper airway patency, again, you know, if someone's had a tracheostomy and they potentially had a lot of edema or swelling or, or um, sort of if they've had any um, infections up there or anything, has all that settled? Have they got space around their trachea to be able to ventilate through their upper airway? Because if not, taking that trachea out, it's not going to work, is it? And especially for ICU, have they got any other pending procedures? So certainly... Um, our patients who potentially have been like trauma patients or potentially going back to theatre a lot or plastics patients, things like that. Um, if they've got a trachea, are they going to need to be go under general anaesthetic and ventilated again? And actually, if it's the next day, does it just make, should make sense to leave the trachea in? So it's things like that to consider um, and medical stability. So just to touch on managing emergency tracky situation, I think Lorna had touched on this before, which is the, um, the algorithm, which is on the internet. Um, but essentially, that is quite small. So I thought we'd just go through something a bit more basic here. Um, first thing that you want to go, going to want to do is oxygenate your patient. So if you're in a situation where you've come to the patient that potentially just not looking right, they're maybe not moving the chest, they're potentially looking a bit discoloured, you want to, you want to, first of all, oxygenate them. So wherever you are, give them as much oxygen as you possibly can do. So certainly on ICU, 100% boosting them or we're getting um, off, you know, much oxygen as we can. We're shouting for help and possibly if there's multiple people, can someone auscultate? So again, thinking about in the acute situation, can someone auscultate just to get an idea and give us more information about what's happening? Are they ventilating? Um, can you hear air passing in and out of the chest? Can you pass a suction catheter? So this is quite a good um, sort of information um, because actually this is going to tell us a lot. If you can't pass a suction catheter, then potentially is there some sort of blockage? So at that point, you'd want to remove the inner tube. So take out the inner tube, check if anything's blocking it. Is it patent? If the trachea's become dislodged, which does happen, and actually it's potentially in the complete wrong place now and it's not doing the job we want it to, probably at this stage the trachea needs to be removed. Um, if once the cuff, as I said about, I'm just trying to read, I feel like my screen's over the top. So yeah, if, if the trachea's become dislodged, sorry, wants to deflate the cuff. So by deflating the cuff, we're then allowing them to breathe around the trachea and up and out over the mouth and the nose. Um, if it's so dislodged that it's just causing havoc, it probably needs to come out. The stoma needs to be covered and they need to be facially bag and masked. Um, if the track is still in place, but they're struggling to adequately ventilate, 
then probably at this day they need to be they need to be bagged really with um with a with a with a water circuit on ICU or um the crash trolleys all have um bag valve masks on it, um yeah bags just to touch a little bit on laryngectomy patients which Lorna's just going to briefly touch on for the last 10 minutes is laryngectomy patients are predominantly our neck breathers um, and therefore they can never be oxygenated by their nose and mouth because they've lost that connection so and again Lorna's going to touch on this but it should be very clearly documented um, above the bed if they are a laryngectomy patient so yeah if you've not seen this before it's a little bit small on here um, have a look it's on the intranet don't worry you should never be in this sort of situation by yourself but um, it's always good to know what you should do in a situation like this but I think wherever there's a tracheostomy patient the staff in there should always be staff around who are trained and competent with trackies um, so don't don't worry about this sort of situation we just wanted to put it in as a bit of a um, an extra thing So just going to um, got a couple more slides to finish off. Um, we're not going to focus too much on laryngectomies, but we did feel it was important to mention them at least because I think at the very least you find that you hear the terms tracky and larry a bit interchangeably in some uh, in some areas, particularly with a laryngectomy patient. You'll hear you'll hear them referred to as a tracky patient, um, and that can be quite a sort of dangerous situation to be in. Um, as Nat said, if you've got an emergency situation, you need to be aware that these patients um, have that closure, uh, the, uh, the um, larynx. So there is, they are neck breathers. There's no point ventilating this patient at their mouth. So a, a laryngectomy is, a, is the surgical remove, removal of the larynx. So it's completely removed and it's permanently removed. You're not going to go back and have it un, undone at some point. The remaining part of the trachea is then sutured to the anterior neck. Now you can see on the picture that um, should be on the right hand um, side of your screen with the laryngectomy diagram um, where there is no um, sort of passage of air up to, um, to the nose or mouth. And so they might be referred to as a neck breather. So sometimes patients have these um, wristbands on, um, and they should, when they're in hospital, they should have this uh, sign above their bed. So um, it's in pink rather than green that differentiates it um, from the, the um, tracheostomy um, information. And the algorithm for the um, emergency. Um, uh, management is different because you wouldn't ventilate them um, over, over their mouth. But essentially, you need to check for any um, any blockages um, and and call for help. Um, and you would ventilate over the laryngectomy stoma. Some patients will have a inner tube um, where they can where they can place that in and, and take that out to clean it and, and replace the tube and they may have a speaking valve over that um, and an HME um, filter. Um, I think laryngectomies is potentially a whole new um, training topic and perhaps that's something we can look at in the future. But we just want to touch upon it mainly to highlight the differences. Humidification is something that's important for tracheostomies and laryngectomies though, so this bit kind of matters for both. Um, all, pati all patients require some humidification um, when they've got a tracheostomy or laryngectomy. Those procedures mean that when the patient is breathing through their neck, even if they get if they were with a tracheostomy and the cuffs down, um, their ability to naturally hydrate um, the mucosa and uh, the mucociliary escalator um, and secretions is either not there or it's quite significantly impaired. So secretions become can become much thicker. Um, the ciliary function isn't as good, so mucociliary transport is much slower. Um, secretions can become very thick very quickly, and you can get in difficult situations with trying to clear those secretions. Um, so at the very least, a self-ventilating patient should have some cold water humidification. Um, 
If patients have difficult to clear secretions, then a warm water humidifier like a Fisher Paykal or um, in some areas we use the Airbows. And the, the, the good thing with the Airbow is that you can actually use that with room air and, and just humidify. Um, so that can be really useful for patients who've got thick secretions. And that can be one of the issues when we get patients with laryngectomies admitted. Um, where there's very little secretions or the secretions are very loose, um, an HME filter, so if you've got a ventilated tracheostomy patient, then an HME fil filter might be appropriate. But often those patients when they're ventilated are probably going to be on, on a wet circuit. Um, if you are using an HME, it should be changed every 24 hours and more frequently if you're finding that it's getting um, secretions or sort of moisture building up in, in the filter. Um, Nebulizers might be useful. Um, so a pre regular prescription saline nebulizers if we've got very thick secretions. We might also need to think about other secretion management like carbocysteine um, if, if secretions are an issue. I think that covers everything actually. Um, so if anyone have, has any questions, 